Hey, welcome to Plant Yourself. I'm your host, Howard Jacobson. Two quick announcements before we get to today's show. If you're interested in becoming a health coach, I'm offering another run due to popular demand for people who can't make 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights, Eastern Time. So we're doing another run of the program, which will meet the practicums will meet at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, Eastern Time U.S., which means if you're in Europe or Africa, uh, that might be good for you. Also, if you're in the US and evenings aren't good and you have free time in the mornings, either 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time or 10 to 1130 Eastern, then you can participate. If you want to find out more about becoming a wicked effective health coach, you can go to wellstartcoach.com. Second thing is, if you're not aware of it, Josh Lajani and I have a book that is free on Amazon Kindle. It's called Sick to Fit. And if you just go to Amazon and search for Sick to Fit, you'll be able to download it for free and read it on any Kindle enabled device, even a phone, smartphone, tablet, computer whatever. All right, let's get to today's episode. This is the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm Howard Jacobson of plantyourself.com and wellstarthealth.com. This podcast is part of my mission to help you live a powerful and pleasure-filled life. So I absolutely had the best time talking with today's guest, who is New York Times bestselling author and love goddess, Adrienne Marie Brown. I, I really stumbled upon her work. I was on Facebook, saw an article, went to that site to read the article, and there was a sidebar on whatever website that was about a book called Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. And I was intrigued, and I read the article, and I was more intrigued. And I wrote to the publisher and said, I'd love to have Ms. Brown on the podcast. They sent me her most recent book, Pleasure Activism. And once the book arrived, I knew I was in for an education because her life journey, her consciousness and her activism have led her to experiences and adventures and understandings that I had never considered. And I found myself challenged and flummoxed on nearly every page. And I was kind of nervous about doing this interview, uh, to be honest, uh, because rarely do I approach an interview feeling so out of my depth. But uh, Adrian could not have been more engaging, welcoming and warm. Within minutes, we were just two old friends chatting away, sharing our stories and weaving connection. So I hope you get as much out of our conversation as I did. You know, doing the work I do very often, sensual pleasure is kind of the obstacle to change, especially if it's around food or drugs or the pleasurable feeling you get from staying in bed instead of getting up and doing your work. And, you know, at Wellstart and in the coaching that I do, we kind of focus on discomfort, embracing discomfort and understanding that pleasure does not have to be the be all and end all of our lives. And sometimes momentary pleasure leads to long term pain. So we discussed that. We talked about this wonderful concept of satisfiability. That is, is your pleasure satisfiable? And if it's not, it's probably unhealthy or some sort of addiction. But if you can satisfy the pleasure, if you can have some amount of the food or the experience or the drink or the drug and then not need it again, then that's much more of a healthy relationship. So we talk about sex. We talk about drugs. We talk about food. We talk about life. Um, and about how pleasure needs to be at the center of the political revolution that we need to save ourselves from ourselves. So I look forward to lots of debate, lots of commentary. I would encourage everyone to go out and read Adrienne Marie Brown's books. Pleasure Activism is the, uh, the one we talked about, but she's also uh, written Emergent Strategy, which is a a philosophy of political strategy based on the science fiction writings of Octavia Butler, and who I've also started reading. I've, this this has opened a wonderful can of worms for me. And also an, um, edited uh, a book of essays on Octavia Butler's science fiction writing called Octavia's Brood. So uh, approach this with an open mind, an open heart, and I'd look, look forward to hearing what you think of it. A couple of real quick announcements. Next Wellstart Health cohort begins August 5th, 
2019. Check out wellstarthealth.com slash program if you'd like to find out more and sign up for this 12-week odyssey adventure into better health, happiness, etc., etc. Also, this podcast is supported by those who can afford it and is available to everyone. So if you would like to become a supporter of the podcast and help me out financially, uh, I'm still um, paying for most of this myself, but there is a, a growing crew of folks out there who are helping to contribute to make this something that I can do sustainably and responsibly. You can do that. Just go to patreon.com and just search for Plant Yourself. Finally, um, still pretty sparse in the uh, Apple Podcast review department. So if you've been a longtime listener or you've taken in a bunch of episodes and you think it's good stuff for free in just a few seconds, you can go give a review, drop us some stars and tell people what you think about it. And that would really help us. All right. Enough about that. Let us get into pleasure activism. Without further ado, Adrian Marie Brown, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you for having me, Howard. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm so excited for this conversation because I am prepared to learn so much. Oh, good. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's, a, that's the beginner's mind, right? Yeah, yeah. And because, you know, we're going we're to talk about your, your latest book, Pleasure Activism. Um, and when I... I asked, you know, I, I saw an article about it and I asked, um, I wrote to your, I guess, publisher or publicist or agent or, yeah, or, or the team, gatekeeper, the squad, the squad. Um, yeah, my gatekeepers. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> yeah. Um, and so I did not know what I was going to get when I got the book. Uh, uh -huh. but that's so great that you reached out for the interview before you even knew what the content really was. That's brave. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I knew the two words, pleasure activism and like, mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm in favor of activism and mm -hmm. in a lot of like really scary ways, I'm not in favor of pleasure. Like, right, right, <laughs> right. And or you, is it not in favor or just not in practice? Of? Well, I mean, I want to, I kind of want to get into a little bit of this because like this yeah. podcast and my practice is around helping people get healthy. Mm -hmm. And so there's mm -hmm. this, you know, when, when when we follow our pleasure in a toxic environment, mm -hmm. right? And you, and, yeah. you, and like, there, like, there's so much, I, I hope you have like seven or eight hours set aside because there's so much <laughs> I want to talk to you about. But maybe we can just, you know, kind of g get into it. And I'm just going to be asking all these sort of beginner questions because, Great. you know, you've, this book and your work and your podcast um, have led me into a world in which like none of my normal signposts are are working. So okay. so I'm wow. I'm so happy to have you as my guide here. A whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> and Aladdin just came out. <laughs> like, right. yeah. You're on a magic carpet ride, Howard. Yeah. I'm grateful to be part of that carpet ride for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, ju and just a little uh, aside, you know, the, um, the the initial song from that movie was is kind of yeah. is kind of racist. You yes. Know? And yeah. my cousin sang that. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, what he's, a small he's, weird world. Yeah, he's he's the voice Bruce Adler. He's the voice of he's the voice of oh, that wow. song. Oh, that's hilarious. So that's an odd little thing. Well, yeah. good for you. So, <laughs> so some something something else to atone for. Yeah. Um. So I guess I I'd love to. I'm I'm going to just you know steal the question that you ask on your podcast because it's yeah. it's so graceful and beautiful. So tell us about yourself. How did how did you know the journey of how you became you? Yeah. Um, so the journey of how I became me. I have um, my origin story is my parents are a, a big epic love story. My parents fell in love with each other. It's an interracial couple. My dad. Um, as a black man, he made eyes at my mom across a crowded library space at Clemson University, and they were married within three months and are still together. They work together. They love each other. Um, but I think it's an important part of my story because I grew up in a context where even though so many people were saying, you know, that racism still everywhere and shaping policy and everything else, I also grew up as a living embodiment of some other way that mm. there was a, a, a world in which love was more powerful than the construct of race. Um, and I grew up moving all the time. My father was in the military um, for the first 30 years of, of my life. So we moved 
roughly every two years to a new place. And which meant that early on, my life was all about adaptation. What is the next adaptation that I need to be in? Um, I am a survivor of all kinds of things. And I think like most women I know, um, I'm a survivor of all kinds of sexual traumas and sexual assaults and and just like misguided sexual attention. Um, so by the time I was like entering college, I already had a sense of um, there's something wrong with how gender and sexuality and sex and all of that play out in our modern world. Um, mm-hmm. So one of the first projects that I ever worked on was something called Conscious, um, was it Conscious Movements, I think? And it was, um, we were trying to raise awareness around the HIV AIDS crisis and um, the fact that the numbers were all on par between Botswana and Brooklyn. And it was mind blowing to us that that was the case. And so we started doing um, what we called edutainment events at the time, but it was like, we would do these concerts and all kinds of people, Amani Azuri, John Legend, all these artists who have gone on to do great things um, came and performed at these concerts. And uh, and it was one of the first, now I look back and I'm like, oh, that was actually one of my first pleasure activism things, even though it was before I knew the terminology or anything, but we would, the concerts were always incredible and it was beautiful and people would be dancing and singing and having a great time while also steeping themselves in information around this tragic crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was, so was, then, the, was the goal then to sort of educate people to, to, beha- to health behaviors, to stop the spread, so to keep themselves safe? there was safe? some of it that was about behavior, but there was also some of it that was like, there's a reason why these patterns proliferate in um, Black communities, right? We were looking at the fact that, like, people were thinking of, like, oh, this a- HIV AIDS crisis is happening in Botswana, it's happening in Africa, it's happening in these third world countries. And I was like, no, it's happening here in the U.S. Um, and it's happening just as, it's, it's just as dangerous and severe as it is in those places. Um, but we are supposedly this first world developed nation. How is this still happening here? And it's happening because of the way that society is structured and the way that resources flow, like who has access to the information, who has access to safe sex information and resources. And that actually led me to my first job in movement space, which was with the Harm Reduction Coalition. I just got so interested in what they were doing, which was how do we reduce the harm that comes from people living their lives and engaging in substance use or engaging in sexual behavior um, where absence not may not be an option. And, you know, one of the first aspects or tenets of harm reduction, principles of harm reduction, is that we live in a world that is actually so hard and traumatizing for people. So mm-hmm. people are not using drugs because they're just out here like, gosh, you know, I woke up today and just thought I'd love to be an addict living out on the street corner. You know, like that's not how the journey goes. Usually mm-hmm. the journey is I am incredibly depressed and I want to escape from this moment. And, you know, I had... I grew up in a family where we had someone who was addicted to crack um, as part of our extended family. And I got to see that journey for her and got to see um, the ways that she loved herself and loved her family and the ways that she betrayed herself and betrayed her family um, because she did not know how to deal with all the pain that she felt. And so it just gave me a lot of compassion, you know, and interest of like, so what happens here? And And I think all of that has shaped now where I am because harm reduction is a core aspect of pleasure activism. It's I, There's a whole chapter in there um, where I interviewed the current ED of pleasure activism, and I mean, of Harm Reduction Coalition, because I think that that work, you know, you said, you know, it's all about like, how do we relate to health? And it's like, to me, so much of it is understanding that health is an integrated system of ourselves, right? Yeah. It's not just our bodies can be healthy if our minds are not, or our minds and bodies can be healthy if our spirits are not. Like, it's really like, there's an interconnected system and we have to figure out a way to balance and have dignity across all of it. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that that really touched me from. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell your listeners, Adrian's eating cheese toast. <laughs> OK. <laughs> It's okay. I, I know. Well, they're they're going to write in and they're going to they're going to they're gonna hope it's vegan cheese. So that's that's the issue we're going to. Oh, really? Is everyone vegan? No, but it's a plant based uh, podcast. So OK, uh, beautiful. So, beautiful. I mean, we're, we're gonna... well, isn't plant based like the like my understanding is like plant based is sort of like an iteration from vegan. Like it's like still re- like a lot of the practices might look the same. 
Yeah, well, it's it's more about it's it's less about the the ethical approach. So you might you know yeah. still do leather or, um, or yeah. you know, but it's also sort of like um, I mean, the, we can get into all the internecine <laughs> debates in the in the in that community. But what I, I love wa- every community has their nuances, right? <laughs> yep. Um, but what I wanted to share was in in your in your interview with uh, with Monique and I'm, what's her yes. full name? Monique Tula. Tula. That she, mm-hmm. like so so my business is we help people um, change bad health habits essentially you know, mm-hmm. re- reverse diabetes lose weight get their hearts mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. the program that we created um, I didn't like I was reading okay so I when, I'd never heard of harm reduction coalition uh-huh. or network until I you know saw it in the book and I'm like well, I'm not really sure what that is until this interview mm-hmm. and oh, wow. and she says and this and this is like. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I'm going to underline this for for the core of our program. She says, at the core of harm reduction is unconditional love for people who sometimes have very little love in their lives. Exactly. And like, that's what we do. Exactly. Before we can tell anyone how to eat or how to exercise or anything else. About anything the body. else. <laughs> yeah. Right. It is that like, I feel like so much of what is harmful, what can be harmful inside of the health industries is that piece where it's like starting from a place of shame or starting from an idea that like everyone has access to the same privileges, including the privilege of growing up in a loving space or a loving household or a loving community. Um, I feel like most of the people, if I was to say like, oh, what is a common trait of a lot of the people that I have been moved towards organizing with and supporting? It's that love was not available either at an intimate level or a societal level. So like you know, for the black community, there's a lot of us who are like, it's very loving in my household. And it might even be very loving in my neighborhood. But if I cross out of my neighborhood, I could get shot just because someone is terrified of me because of their racism. And so it's like, what do you do when you live in a society that not only doesn't love you, but actively, like is very active with hating? Mm -hmm. And what do we do when that is institutionalized, right? How then do we have a conversation with people around you know, because I live in Detroit, right? So it's like, I did food justice work for years here, where it was like, we're trying to introduce the idea of like, make yourself a smoothie, you know, to kids who are like, I don't have, any, like, that's a that's a sweet idea. We don't have any of the things we need in our home to do that. And I'm not safe to get from my house to school. Yeah. So before we can talk about the smoothie versus hot Cheetos, we have to have a conversation around what are the structures of my life that make sure that I feel safe and loved and cared for. Right. And, you yeah. know, and, and I think it's, it's, it's I hear, here is what, here's sort of like a, like a challenge that I'm having as I, mm-hmm. as I navigate this material. So, you know, this idea that there's so many things out there in the world that can give us toxic pleasure. And so my mm-hmm. approach has, mm-hmm. has been like, let's avoid those things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the sugar, you mm-hmm. know, like at, at some point you were talking about like liking ice cream and, and like in my mind, I was having this. Like I, was like, lect- no. I was lecture. I was lecturing you. I was like, let me let me lecture Adrian Marie Brown about sugar in the slave trade. Right. Like, yeah, that's kind I mean, of it's so, it's so funny. Like I did a whole sugar shift, you know, like I know almost everything there is to know about sugar. Right. Like because I, I was part of I did like years of just being like, I'm totally going to deny myself sugar, have none of it in my life, all of that. And what I found was it didn't get to the purpose. It didn't get to the purpose of health in my life, right? Like it helped with some things, but a lot of what it did was introduce food dis-ease and disorder because I started becoming obsessed around that denial and being good at denying myself those things Mm -hmm. rather than actually listening to what my body needed, right? But I'll say this, I think to rewind a little bit would be helpful because when I talk about pleasure in the book, one of the things I do is really define it in a much more basic way than a lot of people initially hear Mm -hmm. it, right? And this has been one of the most hilarious parts to me is like, when I get up and do an event, I say pleasure activism to people and they're like, sex dungeons. And I'm like, (laughs) no, like, that's awesome if that's your thing. If that's what you need in order to get off, like by all means, create a sex dungeon, great. But for most of us, it's just an indication of how repressed we are when it comes to pleasure. And so the definition that I work with is the most common definition of pleasure, which is it's just joy, satisfaction and contentment. And that I, I, you know, it's just like happiness, right? 
and how often people are like totally out of touch with happiness for any number of reasons. And there's a really beautiful interview in there with Ingrid LaFleur, and she talks about pleasure principle as a lifestyle. But she says that like that the pleasure should be continuous and in touch. So it's like if you're eating something that in the moment feels good, but later causes you a stomach ache or has a, you have a gluten reaction to or another allergy or it makes you feel, um, you know, or alcohol is this way for me. Like I'm like, I'm very wary of anything that I take in that makes me foggy the next morning Mm -hmm. because that morning Mm -hmm. time for me is some of my most precious thinking, ideating, meditation, spiritual awakening time. And so I'm like, I don't want to, even though it may be fun to have like five scotches, you know, and just like get turned or whatever. Um, I used to do that. I mean, like, it's also funny to look at like different periods of my life. Like in my twenties, that was like an easy night. Right. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, one of them. And I'm like, woo, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm here. But I, I think it's really interesting to think about pleasure as a continuous part of life and not just like what feels good in the moment. And so when you talk about like toxic and pleasure to me, don't even really go together that much because I'm like, things that are toxic for you are rarely creating pl- happiness, right? They're really creating <laughs> contentment or satisfaction. Most of the things that are toxic for us are toxic explicitly because they cannot satisfy you. So you have a little bit and you immediately want a little bit more. And like, you know, that's what happened with the way that the U S um, food industry uses sugar. That's often what happens is like, you're not receiving, you know, like when I sit and have like a little bit of honey in my tea, I feel totally satisfied by the experience. I'm not like now I need 18 more glasses of tea with honey in them. I'm like, no, I just, that was what I needed versus when you have, um, like cocoa puffs or something where they're the way that they're designing it is yeah. to make you consistent, like have just enough to want more and more and more. And it's also the same way with chips or whatever. It's like they're, they're designed to make you never be satisfied. And, you know, the big, big picture of that is I think that that is how capitalism functions, <sighs> right? I really think that capitalism is designed to make us constantly feel like we can never get enough. We're never beautiful enough. We're never rich enough. We're never, getting enough attention. And so we constantly have to figure out ways to purchase, purchase, purchase more things, buy more things in order to get that. And so much at the, at the root of pleasure activism is how do we get off of that um, constant greed and need journey and actually land into like our, our bodies are pleasure centers and pleasure systems. And if we really listen so much contentment and happiness and satisfaction is available and it helps guide the decisions we make, including the decision to get in right relationship with each other and the planet. Mm. And I, I love that word. And you first use it on page 15, satisfiable, like, mm-hmm. like as a, as a litmus test. Mm-hmm. And to me, like, that's, that's it. It's not the substance. It's not you. It's exactly. It's the relationship in the context. So if exactly. I, you know, so if I can, I can have a piece of birthday cake on my birthday and be cool with yes. it. But there's other yes. things that I have a drop of. And all of a sudden, I'm just jonesing for more and more. What are your things like that? Um, oh, my gosh. You're going to call, call me out in front of my audience. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, well, you don't have to say you do yeah. it now. But well, once upon a time long ago, what was yeah. your... Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 more, I, I, I avoid them now because I, I, well, I would say like, yeah, like candies. Like M and M's, Snicker bars. M&Ms. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, for me, uh, studying for an exam or finishing a paper in college was a six pack of Coke and the Halloween sized bags of <laughs> of Kit Kat. That's right. You know That's the ones right. you, the ones you're going to give to like fifty kids. It's like you're that. like all the children in the neighborhood could have this, or I could just have this. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that idea of satisfiable comes from one of my teachers, Stacy Haynes. And I remember her asking it in one of our classes, um, where, which is the generative somatics lineage that I'm a part of, where I've been learning about how do we drop in and center in and live from the body. And she asked it and it like, it, you know, there's that emoji of like the mind being blown. But I felt like that. I was like, what? Like, I, I knew that most of my life I hadn't been satisfied and it never occurred to me that that generating being satisfiable was something that I could be responsible for and I could create in my life. Mm. And it's been a wild, like this past, basically this whole year, since January, I've been in the practice of doing intermittent fasting in order to kind of shift my relationship to food. Cause like I said, I had done the sugar shifting, sugar cleansing, 
and was like, this works for part of my life. And then it doesn't work for a huge other part of it when I'm traveling and I'm on the road and other people are often in charge of parts of the food that I have. And, and I'm often going into places where I don't feel comfortable bringing the privilege of like, here's, here's all the little small, you know, like you have to just for me, create this whole other menu of food. Like it doesn't work if I'm going in and working with a group of folks in a church where they're like, we have just cooked the food for everyone. That's what we do. That's how you're lucky to have some. Like, so Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to find a system that allows me to work with gratitude and be satisfiable and, you know, have the majority of my life. Like when I'm home, I'm mostly am eating kale, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like kale is my favorite food. I make kale chips almost every day or, or just watermelon. Like I could eat watermelon, strawberries and kale like all day long and just be like, I'm super jazzed. Right. But, But then I go travel and I'm often will travel for three weeks to a month at a time but I'm like going and doing speaking engagements and trainings and other stuff. So I was like, I need something that works with my lifestyle and that keeps me from obsessing about food. And it has felt so beautiful to land in intermittent fasting because one of the things it immediately does is highlights what it means to be satisfiable because you have like a small window in which you need to choose the right things that will actually last until the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I love that idea that I'm like, Oh, I get to construct for myself the right set of things. And it just is like amazing to feel what it does for my energy and what it does for my attention. Cause my attention is no longer all day. Like what's the next thing I get. It's just sort of like, Mm -hmm. Oh, during this period of time, what are the best choices I can make? But in movements, right. So for the activism part of it, I often now ask people, what are our, and this is again from somatics. We ask this, what are the conditions of satisfaction, right? Like how will you know that this campaign has reached a place where you feel satisfied or this social justice effort. And it's almost like if you, know, you, can, if if you, you can't, if you yeah. can't do it in your body, you're only going to do it theoretically out in the yes. world. That yes. Is so... It's very, very, very tied together. Huh. And I think, you know, you said you've listened to our podcast. You're starting to listen to the Michelle Mascarena Swan, Mascarena Swan one. Yeah. And, you know, she talks about that idea too, that it's like we, you know, so much of movement generation, they talk about the idea of false solutions and what is politically possible and how we get to the real solutions we need for our planet. And to me, this is one of those areas of where are we satisfiable that we're often being told here, just we'll do carbon tax or something. And it's like, that is technically a solution, but that is not going to satisfy what we actually need to get out of this total catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It's just going to slightly slow it down or worse, make people feel good about doing something that has no impact at all on shifting the future. Right. In fact, I, right? would, I would argue that... So we can't that be it, satisfied. <laughs> yeah, I would argue that a carbon tax actually buys into the mentality of commodification of the planet. Exactly. It's, it's literally that, right? And there's so many things that we do that are like that. And even, you know, like I'm a big fan. Like I went through a period of like, I am a big recycler. I'm a big composter. Like I'm a huge, like I'm trying as much as possible in my own life to move closer to a zero waste mm-hmm. way of living. And it's fascinating to notice how I'm like, oh, what are the false solutions that exist even inside of that framework? That it's like, it's not enough if I just do it, right? Like there's nothing that I as a singular individual can ever do that will be enough as a, that will satisfy what the planet is calling for from us. So my invitation to movement is always that, that it's like, we didn't create the problem alone. We won't be able to create the solutions alone. We have to be in right relationship with each other in community to create something that will satisfy us. And then as humans, we have to learn how to be satisfied with being in a better relationship with planet rather than only being satisfied by constant growth and new consumerist practices. Right. I'm starting to get, yeah. I'm starting to get this. It's like that the lack of pleasure or you know, the way yes. you define it is the big hole that we're trying to fill with all this stuff that can never satisfy it. Exactly. That's huge. And, and this is also, it's also like what we invite people to. So I think about this all the time. And like you probably experience this too, is that you're trying to invite people to health. And the idea is that, oh, if you felt healthy, you would feel better, right? Right. And, but, but a lot of the times the invitation is like so much suffering in order to get to the point that you ever feel better, right? Yeah. And I was just with a good friend of mine who's back. She had a major back surgery this year. And so she's having to do all these little like awkward physical therapy training things. And it's like, she's like, I hate this. <laughs> like, uh-huh. This is miserable. And I remember that when I tore my meniscus, it was like, this is miserable. I can't imagine ever wanting to do this. And like, then I, I had a thought of like, 
how would I ever make this? Oh, sorry. That was a reminder that it's time to do your Kegels. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. all of your listeners should all do our Kegels now. Everybody Kegel together. All right, I'm on it. Um, good. So, but I was like, <laughs> how would I make physical therapy more pleasurable? Like, what could I do to make it feel better? Because this is what my body actually needs. And I'm in that space now where I'm like, oh, every day there's a set of exercises that I could be doing with my pelvis with my knees, with my core, and they would make my life better. How can I make it pleasurable to do those exercises? Because mm-hmm. I, I know I like a million gazillion people will not continue something that doesn't at some level produce a sense of happiness, contentment, and satisfaction in me. And I'm like, if, if we're all like that at an individual level, then collectively that's also our shaping. And I think that's what keeps us out of movement spaces. Cause a lot of times movement spaces are saying, we're all going to die. The sky is falling. The climate is falling apart. Everyone's being shot. Like, it's like everything is a total crisis. So much suffering. Sign our petition. Come to our meeting. And it's just like, what? That sounds horrible, miserable. I don't want to pay attention right. to I'm that. Just, it's I'm just too gonna, I'm just going to take drugs and forget I'm just going to take drugs and lock my or, – or I'm just going to go to my cog in a wheel job mm-hmm. and just, like, do the same thing all day, every day, and then come home and watch reality TV show until I pass out. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's like, whether you do it through drugs, drugs, or like obsessively going to the gym or whatever, you're numbing your aliveness. And we numb our aliveness in like a million ways that keep us from being in touch with what's actually happening. And so a lot of what I'm saying is we need to experience pleasure as human beings. And in our movements, we need to create movements that feel so good and compelling to be a part of. And I keep uplifting Uh, what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, because they're in this massive resistance to say, we want to oust our governor, but it is the most beautiful resistance that I've ever seen. It looks like a party. song. It looks like a massive party. And the schedule includes yoga, meditation, child reading circles. Uh. Like, you know, it's just like, that's a world we want to live in. And governance should always be moving us towards a world we want to live in. And movement should be, should feel like and move us towards a world we want to live in. And that's it. Hmm. And I, so I want to reflect back, like when you, you talked about intermittent fasting. Yeah. Um, like what I heard was like most people when they're intermittent fasting and there's a lot of people like I love it. I think just physiologically, yeah. biologically, it's an yes. amazing thing to do. And there's a whole bunch of people that I work with that I encourage not to do it because yeah. because they're doing it as atonement. Or, exactly. Right. But the way you framed it, you weren't even, you weren't looking at the negative space of like yeah. the, the 18 hours you're not eating. You're looking at like yeah. the six hours that you do eat. So yes. it's, so even there, you're, yeah. you're approaching the, the, the pleasurable orientation towards it. Yeah. And for me, because I have been so I started gaining weight in response to sexual trauma in my early teens. So by the time I became an adult, I was already basically considered overweight. And, and I had tried all these ways to just address the weight, address the weight, address the weight. And it was like, slowly dawned on me, like, that's never going to happen if I haven't addressed the trauma. And so then I spent time address the trauma, address the trauma. And through that, I was like, I'm not actually meant to be a skinny person. Like that's not what's calling to me, but I don't want to be obsessed over food. I can be healthier. I could have less weight and I need less weight on my knees. So I started to be like, okay, what are some options that work for me? For me, intermittent fasting feels like freedom. It feels like I'm gifting myself hours of the day that are just completely free from having to worry about food or think about food. And then Mm. I eat what I really want to eat and love when it is time to eat. And luckily I've, I've made good choices in my life. So I love organic food. I love vegetables. I, you know, like I really could live off of, roasted vegetables and kale and, you know, an occasional, I do like bread, me and Oprah. So, you know, but I also, I'm like, I don't mind it being sprouted and seeded. And, you know, like I like the healthiest version of it. I really love the idea of balance also, like feeling like what is the balance that my body needs in relationship to this planet in this place? And it's one of the reasons I've been moving more and more away from eating meat and red meat. Um, because again, it's like, Oh, this, you know, in the moment, this burger or whatever is giving me this beautiful experience of food and sustenance. But then if I scale back, you know, if I open my eyes a little wider, I'm like the misery that goes into the beef industry and the misery that gets produced from it. And the fact that we are landing, you know, like so, you know, I just came from New Orleans and it's like 
so much toxicity is flowing down the Mississippi River into that delta and into that gulf because of this meat industry. And and then you start to just widen out. It's like, oh, a huge portion of our environmental crisis is because of these temporary pleasures of a meat experience that are actually not even what our, our bodies necessarily always need. So I love getting into the, you know, for myself is like telescoping out until I can see a bigger picture and then trying to make a, a, a decision inside of that. So now it's like, you know, and I'm also not like, oh, let's all go to the Beyond and Impossible Burgers. I'm like, those are delicious. And it's also a huge industry in order to make that come off. I'm like, mm-hmm. what about dropping into actual food that you can grow from the ground? <laughs> you know what I mean? I also think, you know, I, I know that I, I, I would be surprised if you had read Octavia's Brood. But Octavia's Brood is the book that I put out before mm-hmm. Emergent Strategy. And it's all science fiction from social justice movements. Right. It's well, all about I, getting in right relationship with apocalypse, right? Yeah. And the idea that like, apocalypse is not going to leave us with a lot of room for producing stuff that we're shipping halfway around the world to eat um, or these massive industries. We're going to have to be in right relationship with what we can grow and eat from the ground. And and so to me, it's all like, let's just practice getting our bodies ready, whether it's this generation or the next one for that, that definite reality. Yeah. There's a part of me that's like a survivalist (laughs) or Mm -hmm. a prepper. Which I don't, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't highlight very much in public, and it's not like, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't include like guns and ammo, yeah, which okay. which might be, you know, short sighted <laughs> for a period well, of time. It depends on like what survival, like what you're willing to do to survive. I think this is the big, like I tell people to go read Octavia Butler's work all the time because she plays with all these complicated questions of like, well, what would I do to survive? What would you do to survive? Yeah. What would you do in a group of people? What would you do to, to protect someone that you love? Like I would, I, I, before my sister had her kids and I, you know, I call the kids nibblings, right? And I'm like, they're the children of my sibling and I don't have to like gender them necessarily as niece mm-hmm. or nephew. But I talk about my nibblings and I'm like, before my first nibbling was born, I would have said, I am a pacifist. I do not believe in violence. I feel like a nonviolent soul, a nonviolent spirit. And there's just nothing. And even though I had been through so much trauma of my own, that when I when other people learn of it, they'll be like, I want to kill that person. I want to hurt, harm that person. Whatever. I'll be like, that's not what I want. Mm. I want that person to heal so that they don't create that harm ever again. But then when those children were born, I was like, if anyone talks, touches this child, I'm, they're going to die. And I'm like, is that in me? Like, do I really have that in me? And I often, you know, think about that. And I'm like, if if I was in a scenario in this post-apocalyptic world where it was like, how am I going to keep my these babies safe? Like my responsibility is keeping these babies safe. I'm like, Oh, everything changes, you know? So I think about that. I'm like, and I, and I think the counter question of that is, would I want to survive in a world in which the only way to keep them safe was to be committing violence? Right. Is it is it worth it? Or is that the time when we say the human experiment has run its course and, and the earth is, is time for the earth to come up with the next generation? I will say I've been... I've been some peace has entered my heart because there was this recent story that came out about this. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the bird now, like red throated Oriole or something like that. Basically this bird that went extinct like 157,000 years ago. And like somehow the earth has recreated that DNA, that process, that bird. Huh. And it has come back into existence after this long period of it being extinct And something about that gave me so much hope for our species that like, even if we do move ourselves to the point of extinction in this period of time, that is there something inevitable about humanity that would mean that it would come back around or that would find a way to to recreate itself. Um, And, you know, which is basically the story of Battlestar Galactica. (laughs) (laughs) But but I enjoy it. I enjoy the possibility of like, um, you know, how do we learn as much as we can learn and like put that into the universe in a good way without being attached to the outcome that we have to be here on the other side of it? Because there's, I think there are futures that are not worth surviving. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have to say, you know, so I, um, I do audio books when I garden and I, um, Oh, you do. I did, you listen to them. Yeah. And I, oh, I, cool. I did, uh, I tried wild seed. Uh, I want to say this is about three months ago. And that would be a hard one to do an audio book of. I got, I, you yeah. know, I got a third of the way into it. I'm like, I don't really connect with it. But after reading, you know, yeah. your, your um, homage to Octavia Butler and starting and, yeah. and, and really seeing it through, through, yeah. through your eyes. I went this morning, I read, I, I'm, I'm 
blanking on the name <laughs> of the story. It was a short story um, about the sort of using humans as uh, to, oh, from Bloodchild for the yeah, Bloodchild for the eggs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. I'm like, oh, like, OK, this is about this is about humans without agency over their bodies. And I'm exactly like, like, oh, you know, I'm and a, I I'm think a, in that story, particularly, she's casting that men are being used you know, men are being used basically to cultivate the space of these alien babies that can only be removed mm. by surgery, surg surgical removal. Yeah, I love that because Octavia is like, if men had to live the way that women have to live, everything would change immediately. <laughs> like if, if men were asked to put up with like, you know, the fact that we live in a country now where people are like, there's legislation over what you can, whether you have to have a child out of your body if you've been raped mm. is insanity. It's insanity. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but it, it, it only makes sense in a patriarchal world where men are like, fundamentally, women's bodies are about how we want to use them rather mm -hmm. than fundamentally, all human bodies are about evolving the human experience. <laughs> right. you know? But I will say Wild Seed is, is my favorite of Octavia's works and that the pattern Patternist series is my favorite and it's not an easy read. But the place I recommend people start with her work is the parables. The parables are very much, it's the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents. And it's basically written about this period that we're in and living into right now. Mm. And where there's, there's actually a radical right fundamentalist president who runs for office with the slogan, make America great again, and is aligned with sort of Christian fundamentalism uh, huh. like a violent, militia Christian fundamentalism, all of which is very much like what we're in right now. And she she wrote um, this in like the the eighties. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's just sort of like oh, and you know, my friend Toshi Reagan was also on our podcast, but she said that like it's not that Octavia was necessarily like a prophet or something. It's just that she was able to pay attention to the patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Boy, uh, if I thought the guy in the in the Oval Office could read, I'd be worried <laughs> that he got the idea from her. <laughs> no, you know, I think that Ronald Reagan also used the slogan. I think it was like it's been floating around, but there's something about the the combination of factors, and you know, I, we li we're just in a different time. Like I think most most people who have been alive for more than forty years, this president was un uh, this was like an unimaginable scenario. Like it's just like well, we would never have a reality TV show failed business person as a president. Like that just is unimaginable. Yeah. And I think it shows the power of culture, right? That like people overlook that culture is constantly setting the norms. And so culture, like pop culture, you know, um, musical culture, television culture, like the ways that arts culture sets the norms for all of our reality because it's where we, understand imagination and it's where values get practiced. And while many of us were like not paying attention to what he was doing in the culture, he was helping to set a norm for a very vindictive, violent and childish culture, a, a way of being and a way of like uplifting the villain, right? And being like, oh, the villain is the most interesting part of the story. Mm. Like that's not how most stories have been conceived of or written. It's always there's a protagonist and the villain is the side character, the smaller character. Yeah. And like his work has all been like, no, the villain is the most interesting central character. And, and this even is if also, you hate this is him, also you're still going to give him all of your attention. Mm. This is also, right? you know, the Breaking Bad and uh, the exactly. Sopranos. Exactly. This right? fa this fascination all, with this fascination with like who is who is really intentionally going against the goodness or the humanity or whatever. And they're, that's so interesting. And I, I will say, even for me, I'm like, I don't deny my interest in those things. I think we're all interested because inside of each of us, there's a question of like, how far would I go? Mm -hmm. You know, like if I was unhinged, if I didn't believe in all these rules, how far would I go? And to me, so much of meditation, mindfulness practice and being in community is about exploring those things in a safe space and then being able to return to like, I have the agency and the choice and I'm connected to something larger than myself. And so I make these better choices. Yeah. Well, you know? I, I love what you just said. Cause like, if I didn't believe in all these rules, like from yeah. what I know about you, you believe in fewer rules than anybody. Yeah. I've ever well, and it, it's, it's, it's very, to me, it's very much about like saying, I don't believe in the rules and I don't believe in the rules where they are not aligned with what I believe is good. 
right? Which I learned from Martin Luther King Jr. He talked about that, that like, if a law is unjust, it is our responsibility to break that law, right? So for a long time, I worked for something called the Ruckus Society, which trains people in doing civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action, where we feel like, oh, this law is upholding something unjust, or this policy is upholding something unjust that puts us out of right relationship with the planet, that puts us out of right relationship with each other. And I've learned so much. You know, there's indigenous leaders in that work. There's immigrant leaders in that work. There's black movement leaders in that work. And over and over again, I've seen like our, the way we get acculturated to be polite in the face of violent, offensive transgressions against humanity is our downfall right now. That it's not just, you know, and I, I grew up part, part of my life in Germany. And so I often think about like living in a country where um, the reason that things were able to get to the place that they got to was not because everyone was a Nazi, but it was because there were too many people who were scared to be rude to the Nazis mm. or to reject the Nazis or to say that is unacceptable behavior and unacceptable thinking. And by the time people started to offer that resistance, it was so late. And now we're in that same place, you know, here in the U.S. where it's like y you are more concerned with keeping the peace at the family dinner than intervening on racism that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like the opposite should be the case. And how do we invite people back into that being able to feel what's right and wrong? That's the other piece of pleasure activism. If I was to say like, oh, and there's this other component is once you drop in and you can feel pleasure, it also opens up your ability to feel everything, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, if I know what pleasures me, I also know what doesn't pleasure me. I could feel a no, a clear no in my system. And I want more and more people to awaken to that boundary inside of ourselves that says, I will not stand for this. I will not let this community stand for this. We cannot have it. Um, so that we can learn boundaries, right? Because I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be able to stop white nationalism in my lifetime. I don't think even if I give all the love in my heart out that I will be able to change those minds. There's a different commitment there. But I know that I, I, be, I believe that I deserve a boundary between myself and those who wish to engage in that kind of hateful behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so much of my work is like, where do I set the no? And this country might have to set that no in a, in a much larger way than I think most of us have imagined. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted at what I perceive to be the inner work that, that you have to do to mm -hmm. maintain both love and a boundary to white nationalists yeah. <laughs> who, who, see, who see you as less than human. Yeah. I mean, you know, it helps that I have white family. So it, ha it helps that, you know, like I, I, I think it's really like I can't imagine it for most of my most of my community that I work with, which is black organizers. If they don't have white people directly in an intimate familial setting, I'm like, I totally get why you're like, fuck it. <laughs> There's nothing to be done here. <laughs> but for me, I'm like, I'm friends and love family members who I know are racist and transphobic and homophobic who I don't feel comfortable going to visit. Like, and I still love them, you know, and I still am in their lineage with them. And some of them are very Christian, you know, they feel like what they feel is justified by a religion, by a Bible. Um, and I see the wholeness of those people, right. That I'm like, Oh, you're a racist. Who's also thinks of yourself as a good person. Who's also trying really hard to be a good dad. Who's also, you know, um, trying hard to figure out how to age well. And, you know, all the same things that everyone else is dealing with. And I'm like, it, I get very curious. I'm like, even having me in your family has not shifted right. this, this deeper, deeper sense of superiority. Um, and so I just get really curious. I'm like, how did humans get this way? The other thing that shapes me is we're not in a place yet where we can send anyone off of this planet in a meaningful way. Right. So it's not like I can be like, white nationalists just got to go. There's no room on earth for y'all. Because I would definitely, like, if that was the option, it was like, listen, we're going to set Mars aside for the white nationalists. They're going to go over there and just have like a white planet. I'm like, fine. Right. But unfortunately, right. <laughs> send, not one send, of our send them to the planet named after the god of war. Exactly. That's where they want to be anyway. But I mean, the other part of that is like, so much of these concepts of superiority, hype, you know, white, whether it's white supremacy, white nationalism, patriarchy, you know, heteronormativity, all these ideas of like, this is the better way. This is the normal way. This is the better way. Unfortunately, most of those are not satisfied with just existing, right? 
which would be fine. Like if, if straight people were like, Hey, we're straight. And it's just, we just enjoy being straight. And like everybody else can do what they want to do. We're just straight. Right. <laughs> I'm like, it wouldn't be so problem problematic. Right. It's the fact that people are like, we're straight. We built an entire religion that articulates that men and women are the only way people can come together or multiple religions that have just decided that hetero heterosexism is the only way to survive. And we're going to violently attack anyone who wants to live their lives differently. That's always the part for me where I'm like, I don't mind different ideologies. I mind violent imposition of your ideology over my nature. Mm -hmm. That's when we start to have an issue. I'm like, I didn't choose any of the ways that I was born, but I happen to be black and queer and fat and all these other things. And no one's going to impose their way over me with violence. I, I have to exist. I do exist, you know? Um, and that's often the thing. I'm like, my existence is as miraculous as anyone else's. And yeah. that's the planet we live on is a planet of miraculous existence. That's often in self-denial. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you, you wrote that, I mean, here's, here's something where I'm, I feel like there's a dynamic tension in my mind that I'd love for you to, to, explore, to explore with you. Um, <laughs> so on the one hand, you know, I don't know exactly who my audience is, but I'm just pretending that they're like me. They're, 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 That's this, what we all do, right? This is all. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, you um, and I are the same. <laughs> yeah. Or at least, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know how many people have been exposed to the things that I've just been exposed to in your in your book. And in, 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 oh, got it. And mm -hmm. and so like I'm thinking, you know, and, you know, it's sort of a plant based vegan community. So there is mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this, um, the, the latest article on uh, bitch media about the cake sheet caking. No, but yes, Smith, it. it was um, basically saying that the, um, you know, wellness movement is sort of fraught with privilege and racism and uh -huh. fat shaming. Yes. And it's, it was a hard thing for me to read. Yeah. Because there's so much that I love about, and there's so many opportunities for people, even without you know, yeah. privilege and means to make healthier choices. But still, I, like, I'm, you know, I'm being tenderized yeah, yeah, yeah. by all this. Yeah. But, you know, so I guess the, the, the thing you wrote is that one, <laughs> um, um, where is it? I wish I could read my own writing. I, um, it's hard. Ba well, basic, basically that, um, the, 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 we have to, um, a, a pleasure activist movement movement needs to focus on those who have been most oppressed. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so given that, I'm like, I think it's like a weird question. Around the pleasure of those most oppressed, yeah. Yeah, the pleasure, focusing on, the, on giving pleasure to those who have been most oppressed, as opposed to, you're right, demanding scarce justice from our oppressors. Yes. And so my curiosity is, what, what do you want me to know about, like, how can me, how can uh -huh. I, inter interacting with pleasure... Yeah. In this way that feels so culturally alien and unconditioned mm -hmm. and bodily weird. Yeah. How can how can me doing that help the people who are most oppressed? That's great. I really appreciate the question there. Um, I think a lot of what happens with people as they're in once you're in privilege and then saying, oh, I'm going to turn my attention towards my own wellness and really get in touch with my own health is that it becomes such an individual journey, right? And like, maybe you pull a few people into it, but a lot of it is monetized. Like, it's like, let's all together join this gym or let's all together start ordering our food only from this place or let's all together do this other thing that we figured out is now the healthy trend. You know, so much of the wellness community is also trend-based. Like, it's like these trends right. move through like waves, right? And so much of what I think needs to happen inside of that is just like, how do I broaden my view so that it's not just like I can have it, but like, what, how would I help structure a society in which everyone had access to the option of, for instance, a plant-based lifestyle? What would that have to look like, right? Mm. And that's one piece of it. I think the second piece is a little bit about what we were talking about earlier with numbing and the way that we can get numb and, and narrow with our worldview so that we're not even aware that there's that much suffering happen, happening. Or like what a lot of us will do is once we start moving to our, our own wellness, we're like, I don't even have time. I don't want to put my attention on all that suffering. And so I don't want right. to see that it's happening. So right. I'm I think a great I way to think about this. Kale and positivity only. 
kale and positivity. That's it. Right. But I also think it's like, if you look at just the food chain, I think that's a great example, right. Is for people who are going into a whole foods or a Trader Joe's or, you know, the places like that we can get sprouts, you know, like the different kind of healthier food stores that are coming up as an individual, someone's like, Oh, I'm a white man and I'm walking into this store and I'm, I'm choosing the most organic and I'm choosing the eggs that are like, you know, these chickens were wearing tutus and flying around with unicorns and like, they're so happy and they gave us these eggs or whatever. Right. And like, there's just so much attending to the care of those selections and not being like, who are the workers right on the other side of that door who are actually, you know, stuffing all these healthy things in there. What are they eating? Right. Who are the workers who raise those chickens? What are they able to eat? What do they have access to? Right. Going down the line of production of how you received what it is you have. Um, that's one thing that always to me lights up where I'm like, that's one, that's one of the fastest ways you can start to tune in to those who face more oppression than us is thinking about like the long lineage that have the long line between food coming out of the ground and actually making it onto our tables mm -hmm. where all, for many of us, we're not the direct line that where that is happening. I think the other place where we can pay that attention is thinking about what we have. So I often say that like resources are either time, like people's time or people's money, right? And if it's money, that doesn't just mean like physical money. It also means like land, home, resource, like the things that we feel like we own. And often when we're like in that wellness world or in that health world, we're not thinking about the entire spectrum of like how much people, how much of people's time and how much of people's resource did it take to produce this thing for me? Because we're all living on this space, but some of us feel like, oh, so coconut water is a great example for me that I'm like, how many square feet of coconut trees does it take to feed my coconut water habit? Whose land is that? Are they getting access to coconut water? Right. Have I taken all the coconut? You know, this was this uh, thing that happened a few years ago with quinoa. Where it was like mm -hmm. the folks who are actually growing quinoa no longer have access to it because so much of it is being sold to the rest of the world that everyone's got to have quinoa. And so the folk, you know, or whenever I visit Hawaii, it's a devastation because all the fruit in Hawaii is being harvested, shipped and sold to other places. And it actually sometimes is getting shipped back. And that's, what's being sold in the grocery stores there for mm -hmm. exorbitant prices. Can, right? can, cans of dole. Exactly. Right. And it's like, Oh, this is, this is how right. we experience pineapples. Right. So a lot of those to me, becoming aware of the means of production and the journey that food is taking or the journey that a product is taking yeah. to reach you. That's a great way to become more mm -hmm. attuned to like where might oppression be happening and always, always trying to break down that distance between the consumer and the producer, the grower, okay. the, right. the person who brought it out of the dirt. So my reaction to that is like, yes. And that seems like the opposite of pleasure, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, so... my thing is like, it's, that's where the activism comes in, right? Is this, I didn't call it hedonist activism, right? I didn't call it like, it's just all pleasure for everybody all the time. It really is, we all deserve access to pleasure, but given how much access some of us already have, there has to be redistribution of that access mm -hmm. in the same way there has to be redistribution of anything else. Just like I'm not, you know, like when I talk to very wealthy people and they're like, giving up my money doesn't seem like it'll be fun for me, right? Yeah. I'm like, it's not about it being fun for you. It's about putting you in back in right relationship with community. Right. Mm. And I feel the same with this where it's like, I don't want you to not have pleasure. And I think if you're in the right communities, it actually is very pleasurable to start to tune into and build relationship with the other people who are producing that food. Like there's a stand in the Detroit, um, basically it's like our farmer's market, Eastern market here. It's called grown in Detroit. It gives me immense pleasure to redistribute my buying from Whole Foods Kale to going to that stand where there's mm -hmm. a bunch of black and brown young people who like they grew that food and they feel so proud of themselves. And I'm making sure that my resources are going straight to them. That's a redistribution model. That's me using some of my privilege to re move these resources. And it's a total pleasure to experience. Right. right? But isn't, like, isn't there a difference, though, between like, like we can redistribute resources, but I I kind of feel and feel free to you know argue with me. On yeah, this. Yeah. I feel like we don't need redistribution of pleasure. I don't feel like the people mm -hmm. that I hang out with who are, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's well, really it's right. It's also wing. like not coming from a scarcity model feels like a really important piece of this. So yeah. focusing on increasing the pleasure of the most oppressed 
doesn't decrease your pleasure. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not saying like you have to take your hot tub and move it into the hood. That's not the Mm. idea. The idea is how do we actually tap into the natural abundance of this world and understand like there is enough for all of us. If we stop competing over the resource, there's actually enough for all of us. And then to me, it's like, if I focus on those who have the least that, and if if the least have it, then everyone else is going to have it. And this is a, a homework assignment I'll give to you and to your readers is a piece of writing called the Kumbahi River Statement. If you have never read that, it's a beautiful piece of writing that was done by a bunch of black feminists. And I think it's really powerful, but it talks about how, because of the structures of oppression, if you look at those who have the least and you focus on them having more, then it would mean that it would necessitate that everyone else who had more also would be in that, in that zone of having enough, Mm. right? Like you can't give to the least without making sure that everyone along the way is having enough. And that's the idea, right? Right. It's not taking, it's, it's really shifting the way we think of what we have period that there's an abundance if we hold it collectively and there's always going to be a scarcity if it's held individually. Right. And yeah. And that if I have, I, I have been socialized with a scarcity model, Right. From, we all have. From, we all have. Like, we I, live in America. Yeah, I get. Yeah, <laughs> I know? need. I we need to get. I need to get good grades, and I need to get better grades because it's being graded on a curve. I need to get be competitive to get a better job. So right. if, from from that place, like that's where I'm kind of like the, the parts that were hard for me in the book were you're talking about sex and drugs and how these can be used for personal transformation. Like, yeah, I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do all the political stuff all day. I will virtue, yeah, yeah, I will yeah. virtue signal. I will write tweets. I will protest. I will make the t-shirts. And yeah. like what, what I, what you have to offer me is to get into a, a right relationship with like primal pleasure that, yeah. that I find very challenging and scary. Totally. I mean, I know we're at time and. So I'll just say this and then I have to hop Mm. off because I have another one. But I will say that I'm not I don't I I wrote the book in a way that was like, I don't think that this is a fully um, a perfect hypothesis yet. Right. Mm. Like for me, it's still in the realm of question that what I want is for us to live in a world in which justice and liberation feel good for people. Mm. And so that it, it, we are moved and compelled to engage in practices of justice and liberation with each other, which means we have to drop out of the punitive ways that we operate now. And we have to drop out of the scarcity models that we operate now and fall back into our natural abundance and our natural way of communicating with each other, which watching children always helps me. Watching most animals always helps me to understand like there is a part of our nature that helps us be in this right relationship. And there's a lot that we have constructed that pulls us away from it. And an orgasm or a good high that's in a safe space or the pleasure of, you know, wearing a wardrobe that you love or the pleasure of finding other people that are in your age group and talking about how do we have sex at the age of 60 or, you know, the different practices that are in there. They're all about dropping back into that abundant and delightful world of being alive that people are like, Oh, I want to live for this. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to keep moving in that direction. We know that the other direction doesn't work, you know? So we know that like living in a world of total, total scarcity and misery doesn't work. So I'm just saying like, why not try the other way? Why not try it? Right. Right. (laughs) So, so the the book is pleasure activism. I'll include a link to the show notes for people who want to, people who want to follow you, read your writings, um, stay up with you on the podcast. Where do they go? Um, the two places I send people, three pieces of places I send people. So the podcast is called how to survive the end of the world. (sighs) And it's available on Stitcher, on Apple podcasts, on SoundCloud, uh, most places where you find podcasts. And my work is at adrianmariebrown.net, adrianmariebrown.net. There's a bunch of my blog writings and links to any other work that I'm doing. And then I'm on Instagram. That's the main place like where I do my social media, like sharing and posting. And I just try to uplift what I see as examples of pleasure and examples of emergent strategy in the world. Beautiful. Well, Adrian, thank you so much. I'm so I'm so touched and befuddled. <laughs> By your Good. work. I really appreciate your bravery and confusion and vulnerability in the conversation. 
and I hope that it's of use. Oh, I, I'm, it already has been. So awesome. Love, lovely getting to meet you and you too. May your, may your work be a, be a blessing upon the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Can you see why I said I had so much to learn from Adrian Marie Brown? And she's actually coming to my neck of the woods uh, next week, August 7th. She'll be giving a talk in Durham. So if you're in North Carolina, you should come check that out. I believe it's free. It's in a it's in a church somewhere and a good time. I hope will be had by all. So if you enjoyed this episode, and you'd like to support our mission. Of course, you can subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. You can share this on social media and you can become a supporter of the show with an ongoing monthly contribution over at patreon.com. Every little bit helps. For more information about the WellStart Health 12-week intensive program, check out wellstarthealth.com slash program. And if you want to check out the show notes for today's episode with links to everything we talked about, you can check it out at plantyourself.com slash 333. If you're new to the show, you can catch up on over 300 archived episodes over at plantyourself.com. All right, garden news. Uh, too much eggplant. Can't eat it all. Can't uh, give it away. Same with the squash. Uh, we're getting in this this, this long crook neck, neck squash. Which I'm, we're not even sure if it's winter or summer squash. Uh, we're not great at keeping records. We just like throw things on the ground and water them and whatever comes up, comes up. Blueberries are almost done, but they're not quitting. Uh, last year, this time, we'd been done with blueberry harvesting by about two or three weeks. So uh, weird climate stuff going on, um, but uh, in, in a lot of ways awful, but in the blueberry way, kind of cool. In running news, I had my first bailout on Saturday. I was scheduled to do 14 and about 11. I called Mia and said, hey, would you like to come get me so I don't have to, to hobble home? So that was a little disappointing, but it happens. I had my uh, my first DNF, do not finish, was in a uh, not a race, but just a, a run. My back's tweaked quite a bit today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to take it easy and... Uh, a lot of people are telling me to just stop running for a little while, do other things while I heal, do swimming, do uh, elliptical, do yoga. Maybe I should start listening to people. I don't know. It's not like me. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about thanks. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use Sabali Dawn, the Dance of Peace, as this show's theme music. Check out willridenauer.com for more. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons, as in... Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Morrow, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Burns, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Kina Ahern, Jen Volkanovsky, David Bizek, the Mysterious Michelle X, Elizabeth Feldman, Victoria Dolomanova, Leia Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrew, Josina, Julianne Rowland. Stu Dolnick, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes with Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wade Pedersen, Leanne Peterson, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Tom Franzek, Jeanette Benham, Gila Lacert, David Donahue, Blair Seibert, Dorona Vizov, Jew and Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesner, Ruth Ann Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, The Equally Mysterious, Tracy Z, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lenneman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harper, Stephanie Holmes, Martha Bergner, Nicole Ramsey, Susan Ahmad, Molly Levine, the Inscrutable Harry R, Susan Laverty, The Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Ashley Corker, and Kelly Machia, Dean Norton. Bonnie Lynch of Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Shell Rutledge, Julian Watkin, Fred O'Connell, Brian Sheridan, Shannon Hirschman, Kate Rolls, Linda Ayat, Julie Lang, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainlein, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Avivilla L, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Orlikoski of Plant Power for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Jarrah Karen and Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild. Kelly Baker, Miracle, and Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Divot, Joshua Sommermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Debbie, Deb Casilla, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Corny, Stephen Leenan, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Nana Kartz. Deanne Bishop, Bill Elf, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trisha Adams, Ian Kramer, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bayshore, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gullish, Laura Heaton, Make for Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Joan Borstein, and Diana Goldman for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for this week. As always, be well, my friends.
So if you appreciate the Plant Yourself podcast and would like to help support the mission of the show, there's a few easy ways to do it. One is to just go to wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. Let other people know about it. Give us some stars. Give us some love. And that really helps us be found by more people. Something else, of course, you can do is let someone know about this podcast, someone uh, who you think would benefit. Send them maybe a couple of episodes that you think would uh, pique their interest or just uh, ask them to subscribe in general. And third, you can join arms and become a patron, a financial supporter of this show. You may have noticed that there's no advertising in the show and it's free for everyone and it's supported, paid for by those who can afford it. So if you would like to make a one time contribution or an ongoing monthly pledge, you can do so at plantyourself.com slash gift. All right, time for thanks. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willridenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Mauro, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jean Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Barnes, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jen Filkonofsky, David Vizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrews, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes with Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Janet Selby, Kara Adams, Tom Fronsek, Jeanette Benham, Gail Lacerte, David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Toronto Vizo, Gio and Carol Argentati, Jody Friesner, with Anne Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck. The equally mysterious Tracy Z, Aviva Lael, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harperson, Martha Bergner, Susan Amon, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R., Susan Laverty, The Panda, Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Scharf, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch, Plant, Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Julian Watkins, Breed O'Connell, Shannon, Hirsch, Shannon Hirschman, Linda Ayat, Colm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzawak, Connie Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis. Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olakoski, a plant powered for health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen and Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Divid, Joshua Sommermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darmy Kelly, Laurie Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McEntee, Dan McCorney, Stephen Lehman. Patty Martino, Mike and Donna Cards, Deanne Bishop, Bill Brielf, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trisha Adams, Ian Kramer, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bashford, Gun Marie Hagen, Tracy Gullis, Laura Heaton, Meg from Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, Diana, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parham Ganchi, Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt. Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Olga Sidoroska, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught, Avedible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sagar Nayak, Erica Piedra, and Danielle Roberts for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for today. As always, be well, my friends.